So I'm going to read to you a little bit from chapter four. Um, this book is really concerned with gentrification and what happens. It's on, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, I, you can tell I don't need it, right? <laughs> so the book is really concerned with gentrification and the displacement of our communities. And so, you know, one of the things that I was very chicken shit, and pardon my French for the children, but I was very nervous and scared about writing the scene because I was like, how is it possible that someone would convince someone else to what my main character convinces people to do? So this is, <laughs> this is my attempt. Um, and this was one of the, I would say, one of the most difficult scenes that I wrote. Eusebia willed herself to stop the sensation of movement, of falling and twirling through the air in opposite directions at once, a, na a nauseous feeling. Usually, this was the moment that forced her to close her eyes and seek lower ground. Not today. On weak knees, she walked to where the women stood and inhaled deeply as she leaned over. Beneath them, on top of this building, it was as if a bomb had exploded. Bricks and pipes, concrete, refrigerators, stoves, even farther away, discarded toys, a doll with matted blonde hair, a blue truck missing a wheel. She was puzzled at the sharpness of her vision. How could they have done all of that in three days? How could they possibly have gotten that done so fast, one of the women asked. They discarded the old building to make room for what? Her friends, the tongues, asked. Eusebia never imagined there would be this much space. I have an idea on how to stop all of this from happening, she said. The tongues looked at her curiously. What if we just scare everyone into thinking this neighborhood is really bad, she said. The women smiled, thinking at a joke, brilliant in its simplicity. How would we do that, they asked. Eusebia could clearly see the unvoiced thought that it would be too easy to work. Eusebia then spoke in a confident way, as if this conversation had already happened. She explained she meant recruiting their neighbors, who would act out crimes throughout the neighborhood with other volunteers who'd be victims of these crimes. You mean fake crimes, they asked. No, not fake, real. Who'd be crazy enough to move to a neighborhood amid a crime spree? What kind of crimes, they asked. <laughs> Eusebia was quiet. She had come up with a list, but she knew if they participated, helped formulate it, they'd be in. What would scare you, she asked. What would be bad enough? This is the kind of idea that can destroy a community, the women said. That can save it, she corrected. The women stared at her, worried. They understood she was serious. She had moved too fast. Eusebia extended her arm around the neighborhood, lovingly sweeping all they could see. Over by their side of the park, Raul's shipping place, the cleaners owned by the chinitos who were born in the yard, the liquor store, the dentist. She wrapped her arm around herself, signaling what they couldn't see. The smell of water boiling for root vegetables, of meat sizzling in pans, laundry being folded, children being kissed, phone calls back home to people who needed help, who would be lost without the support of those who had traveled here. We can just come up with a list of things people are scared of, she said. The women exchanged looks. They spoke to each other with the simple speed of a blink. But now Eusebia was in on it, an eavesdropper. Questions floated among all four of them. Could it work? Was it worth trying? What else as an alternative? It was true, fear would work. Fear always worked. She turned her body away from then, away from the park, her phone vibrated in her pocket. Her daughter Luz or her husband Vladimir must be worried, but she'd care for them later. Now she turned her attention to the destruction beneath them. It talked about something in the women, but Eusebia was the only one who had called out the dead boy's name. She had a strange feeling of being anchored to the tarmac on the roof of that building. It made sense when the blinding sky turned black and the sun was replaced by a yellow pockmarked moon. There was complete stillness and silence in the worksite. The men had gone home. If we don't stop it, Eusebia said, it will not be stopped. Thank you.